I've been in the healthcare for many years. Uh, actually, uh, co-owned an ambulance company in my 20s and was on the fire and rescue squad and uh, up in Mendocino County and went in another direction, went into agriculture and got uh, teaching credentials and was teaching high school vocational ag and managing a large ranch and ended up going to Oregon and doing the same up there and realized that um, I was really pu being pulled back to uh, healthcare. And somebody said, well, why don't you become a nurse? You've done all this stuff. And I said, good idea, I think I will. And uh, I didn't start nursing school until I was 45 years old. What really drew me was Katrina. When we had the, the big hurricane and the devastation in Louisiana and New Orleans, and um, I wanted to be there as a nurse helping, just went for it at that point. I used to have a fear of death. And one of my professors at Concordia University in Portland, Oregon, she had hospice experience and she had a lot of hospice experience. She and I became friends and it just kept attracting me. And then my grandmother was on hospice and YOLO hospice, um, after I met Gwendolyn and actually I had met Craig first, when I was first involved in hospice and I went to a big conference and met Craig for the first time and, and saw what YOLO Hospice was doing. It's where I knew I wanted to be and the people and the heart of YOLO Hospice is what really brought me here. The professionalism, the team, everybody working together to take care of the patients more than I've ever seen is just where my heart is. We didn't know how it was spread, how contagious it was, what was going to happen. And so I had long discussions with Dr. Cade and Gwendolyn um, of the precautions and the PPE that we needed to be wearing and how, um, how, how was I going to keep my family safe. And that was decided by me staying here because I live in Valley Springs. And so there was a commute and my family's in Valley Springs. So we, um, Yolo Hospice, got a uh, studio for me and to stay there for the entire time that I was in the facility. We just needed to make really sure that I was safe, I was keeping my patients safe, and to go on. So it was really with the, the whole PPE and Yolo Hospice provided everything. The donning process is putting on the PPE. You get everything together and you have to put on the TVAC suit or the gowns and you have to put on uh, shoe protection and you have to put on face shields and uh, mouth and nose protection, the surgical masks and, or the N95s. And so that's the easy part, because everything's clean, you're getting ready to go in, but you have to really then think about how are you gonna take this off. At the facility, we had the donning and doffing stations, which were separated. Doffing station, you had to kind of go in opposite, and you had to really think about how you're taking it off. And it was a slow process, because you'd have to take off opposite of what you took on, drop everything down to the ground, and be careful that you're not you know, cross-contaminating yourself or anything else, then dispose of it. And you had to just be really methodical about how, how that was done. You know, we checked each other. We worked as a team and everybody would uh, you know, make sure that your back was tied, that your, your face mask was on right, that your N95s fit correctly, and uh, we had fit tests for the N95s, that's the face mask. And there is already always somebody there watching to make sure that you are doing it correctly, that you're sanitizing your hands in between each step, that you're washing your hands afterwards, that you're disposing of your PPE correctly. Because we were working such long shifts, you would want to take a break in between that donning and doffing, you know, because inside the facility you could not drink any water, you couldn't, um, you couldn't go to the restroom, you know, you were in until you weren't. We would be taking on and off maybe three or four times at least during the day, so we were going through that much PPE. 
The first couple days were very stressful because nobody knew at that point how contagious this was, how protected we were, what kind of PPE, personal protective equipment we had or could use. There was chaos in the beginning because the nurses and EMTs and paramedics that were coming from the CalMAT, they were untrained in the sense of they had never even been in a skilled nursing facility before besides taking a patient in or out. Um, they did not understand the day-to-day -day, uh, care of patients in a facility. There was a lot of training, but then unfortunately, because there were so, much, so many staff members that were out sick with the COVID also, that there wasn't staff members to train these people. And so they were, they were pulling in um, their staff from medical records and other areas of the facility just to help in the paperwork of all the patients too. All the paramedics and the nurses, they wanted to save the lives. They didn't understand that, you know, these patients, they had pulse, they, had, they were DNR, do not resuscitate. They were at, some of them were, had the comorbidities and that did not, you know, they didn't want to keep on living. Some patients did, and we did have patients that, you know, pulled out of the COVID. I would say the first week there was chaos. Getting them used to what we were, you know, what we were really dealing with and letting people go, letting people die the way they wanted to die. These young people that weren't hospice nurses or, or were not, um, they did not understand hospice and very young themselves. Some of them were fresh from paramedic school or brand new nurses even that were getting their, fir their first job was in this COVID climate. And to watch them sit with patients and hold hands and to be with them uh, during, during the dying days of these people. And these people knew they were dying, some of them, and they could not have their family there. We all became the family members. And so we were sitting with them um, just holding hands to the very end. Uh, we, there was from the county some nurses, a volunteer nurse program called No One Dies Alone. And so other nurses from the county came out to sit with these patients also so that somebody, nobody did die alone. Nobody did die by themselves. There was always somebody there with them. They would say it was as if I'm sitting with my grandparents because they got to know the, these patients so well. They were sitting there um, hearing life stories. The team, as they got to know their patients, you know, they really connected with the people there. And so that one picture is of this man who, who actually was a survivor of a COVID and he's, he's in another facility now. Uh, but the, the two young men were, you know, the, it's a nice day, let's go outside. And so it was like, yeah, why not? Take them outside in the wheelchair. And so we got to take them outside and it was a beautiful day and uh, just sit with him and talk and let the sun get on his skin and talk. They were talking about baseball and fishing and, you know, just having a good time. And um, other at other to points, they were you know, playing poker with a mountain in the courtyard. And uh, you, you, they'd get a table of, you know, four patients and three different uh, members of the team, the CalMet team, and sit there and play cards with them. And one of the uh, CalMet team, a little, uh, a paramedic, new paramedic, she was just really lost. She goes, I don't know what to do. And, and there was a piano. And, I, and she said that at one point that she was, you know, she knew piano. And I said, well, go play the piano. She was like a concert pianist and just had us all in tears. It was so beautiful and it just echoed through the hallway. And, and, the, and the people, the, the residents, they just came, I mean, the, the ones that could, you know, you could see them start coming down the hallway. They were just attracted to this beautiful music that she was playing. And so it was just the team. And at night, there was one of the nurses who played the guitar. And so he brought his guitar in and would play the guitar. And another, another nurse was singing while he played the guitar, walking through the hallways. And it was, it was like something, you know, you, we don't get to see this every day. And so it was very special. I feel so honored to really be a, a, have been a part of this experience. I think it was especially challenging for everybody to let go of these people that they've just gotten to know. 
that they felt a connectedness to, and then they're gone. You know, knowing this was their calling, was the paramedic or the EMTs or nurses from other fields, they were able to deal with that. And we had chaplains that would come in and talk to the team, but I think the, the most challenging was for the team to be able to let go. I could think of one young nurse who was a plastic surgeon nurse, had never been in this environment at all. She had never worked at a skilled nursing facility or a hospital. She went right into plastic surgery from nursing school. She just ramped up her leadership like I've never, you know, this young person that just, she became a leader. She took charge of the paramedics. She told them what, you know, she, she felt what needed to be done. She made schedules and they just, they worked together. The team would, you know, they had to care for patients that like they've never cared for. You know, usually a paramedic is at an accident or a heart attack and they take them in the ambulance and drop them off at the hospital. But this was day in, day out care, being able to provide bed baths, being able to uh, change, you know, personal hygiene needs, seeing them work together and figure out how to work together, I think was great to see and making lists and charts of what needs to get done. And like I said, the first week was very chaotic and it only took that time to organize and really make it work. And it was great to see. When the testing began, all the COVID positive patients got moved into one or two wings. And then that sheet of plastic went up between them. So there was that sheet of plastic at the end of a hallway where the nurse station was, and that was the, the negative side. And then the positive side was all of the patients and the, care and the caregivers that were exposed. We were um, isolated from each other also. It wasn't just, you know, with our patients that had the COVID, but we were isolated from everybody else. And that's kind of the feeling, even if you went out into the community and, and said, I was working with COVID patients, it was like we were all lepers. That's what that those pictures really show is the isolation and yet the separateness of, you know, how it, how it is. I was physically and mentally exhausted at the end of those days because there there wasn't many breaks in between, you know, just to use the restroom to get some water and then you're right back at it. And at the same time, you didn't want to quit. You didn't want to go home. It was hard for all of us at that point to leave our stations and think about going home and sleeping. And some of the CalMet people, they didn't go home. They had cots in the right there at the facility and they would you know crash for a few hours and get right back up and go every one of our nurses has been so incredible and they have stepped up to the plate and they're not afraid to go in and i think that's true for all nurses you know this is this is what we do and this is we're not afraid of that we have such incredible caregiving nurses and home health aides and our, uh, all, of our, all of our clinical staff that's going in and, and being part of it, and, and our administrative staff. I mean, without the support, the background support of our administrative staff, we couldn't be doing what we're doing either. And I think this really helped all of us in the healthcare system realize, you know, what it is that we need in our, for supplies, what we need for, you know, who to call, how to be ready, what training do we need. I think that we are all you know, better prepared now and to, for this ongoing because COVID's not done and there is gonna be another wave. Flu season is just coming towards us right now. Um, the numbers aren't slowing down all that much. Because I was completely protected and I did all of the safety precautions as taught and learned, um, to be able to share that and give confidence to our team of that you're not going to get it. If I didn't get it, you aren't going to get it either. You should not get it if you do all the right safety precautions. Mm -hmm.